Well, welcome everybody to today's Lunch and Learn session. This is Allie Orwig with the Indiana Rural Health Association. We do appreciate you joining us. Just a couple quick housekeeping items. We are recording today's session and we'll have it posted to our YouTube channel by the end of the week. So if you're not able to join us for the whole session or if you think it would be a good thing to share with a colleague, we will have that up there. We suggest you check our YouTube channel out. We've got some really great content on there. Uh, so we, we hope that you're able to utilize that in your facilities. Secondly, I want to mention if you want to ask questions during today's session, you can either use the Q&A or chat functions. You can access those by hovering your mouse either at the top or bottom of the screen and some options will pop up for you uh, depending on which view mode you're in. I and Carolyn Miller will be trying to keep an eye on those during the presentation and will act as moderator at the end of the session. So I believe that's everything I uh, wanted to go over to start. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mina and Anand. Thank you so much, Ali. Really appreciate that. Um, everyone, welcome to our webinar for today. We are T-Squared and we are going to review today remote specialty coverage telehealth beyond telestroke. Um, moving to the next slide here. We wanted to review today and, and make sure that everyone's learning objectives are met, which is just let's understand what is the current problem today? What is the access problem with specialty care? What is the opportunity that then provides for hospitals and patients and the system overall? Uh, well, then we'll look more in more detail at that specific value proposition for hospitals by the numbers, going into details on best practices for implementing the program, and then go into the reimbursement trends that are that have been in place before COVID, changed during COVID, and now what is it going to look like uh, in the post-COVID era. So just a little bit about us as a quick background. So my name is Mina Malapetti. I'm the CEO and co-founder of T-Squared. Um, I have a long history and track record of working in the healthcare sector from the business and finance and operations side of things. Um, and uh, my co-founder and CPO, uh, Anna Nathan, who you'll hear from shortly, is uh, also similarly uh, you know, very well versed in the healthcare sector as well as on the technology side of things. So together, we both come from families of doctors and have practiced medicine in rural communities. And we've seen the challenges that they're facing in providing care to their patients. And so uh, we've been working for a long time in the space to make a positive impact. And we are here today to share our learnings on best practices and, and what you can do at your hospitals. So looking at that next slide here, just a little bit of context um, and, and just to frame, frame the problem overall and actually help, uh, make sure everyone understands exactly how big a deal it is today. Um, over almost a third of all hospital admissions and ED visits require some kind of specialist help. Um, so a lot of people are surprised when they realize how high that number is. So when a patient walks into ED, it could be for very common reasons, as well as the, the more unique and complex situations. But even the typical things like a sepsis consult, uh, many times needs an infectious disease consult when the ED physician or the hospitalist attending on the ground is a little bit uncomfortable looking uh, and, and dealing with that plan of care, figuring out what, you know, what is a correct treatment recommendation, what is a correct antibiotic to use, et cetera. And there's, of course, this, this affects all the most common specialties from cardiology and neurology. Um, we've got psychiatry a lot these days as well coming in. We, we've all heard how, how um, underserved that segment of the population is, as well as typical pulmonology, ID, hematology, oncology. So there's a huge um, population of patients out there coming in for admissions as well as ED visits that need the specialist help. But then if you see in the next slide, unfortunately in the US today, over 65% of our hospitals don't have adequate access to the specialists. Um, and, and the reason why I'm sure we all understand is specialists are, are pretty concentrated in certain areas in, in huge metro areas um, is, is where they tend to be found. And the further out you get from that, the less chance you have of finding the doctor that you need when you need them. So that leaves us with, uh, with about 3,300 hospitals across the country with a critical special shortage, which is defined as uh, having three or more critical specialties, and these are the ones driving transfers, um, missing uh, and, and not available on the ground on a daily basis. So what that means is there's a huge opportunity to make an impact if you at your hospital, at your facility, are able to provide this kind of coverage because not having it then is leading to over a million unnecessary interfacility transfers. And again here, unnecessary is defined as 
that facility had the resources. You know, there were, it was not a procedure driven transfer. It was not a specialty, a super subspecialty driven transfer. It's not like they had to go to a leukemia center. Um, it was, it, the MRI was there, the CT uh, machine was there, the formulary was there. The only thing that was missing was a specialist to tell them what are the exact tests to run? What are the exact um, treatment plan to execute, et cetera. So that's leading to lower than ideal bed utilization of about 40%. Um, and then of course, annual revenue lost because of the hospital, uh, because of these transfers to the hospitals that is over $17 billion. And as we all know, um, you know, hospitals are, are working on the razor edge of profitability. So every single patient transferred out, every single patient you're able to keep and treat locally is critical to the continuing financial and operational success of our local community hospitals. Um, India in particular has extremely large access disparities across the counties. And as you'll see here, if you look at the, the counties highlighted in green, that is actually where these specialists are particularly concentrated. We call them urban academic counties. So as, as you can see in the table on the right hand side, while the uh, number of hospitals is, is almost three times as much in the rest of the state with only 30 hospitals in the UA counties, um, the specialist per 100 beds is almost double in those green counties versus where they are. So the concentration of specialists is higher in those green counties, even though the need and the actual just number of beds and number of facilities is much, much greater throughout the rest of the state. So um, it's, it's a big mismatch and it's, it's basically the root of the problem in terms of specialty access across the state. What happened during COVID? As, as we've all seen, unfortunately, time and again, uh, originally with the first wave and then with Delta and now again with Omicron, um, COVID is highlighting these specialist access issues across the state. So what we've seen again and again is that rural hospitals with telespecialty coverage were and are better able to meet these challenges. So there's always been these large gaps in specialty care access. Again, this is across the board, whether it's cardiology, neurology, psychiatry, pulmonary critical care, ID, et cetera. Um, the difference was before COVID, the hospitals and ED physicians were able to manage these patients to the point where they could transfer them out. And that was an option to transfer them out. However, during these COVID surges, and as we're seeing now with, with staff getting sick and, and just not having enough staff overall, we're unable to transfer patients out. The tertiary care hospitals are un unable to accept these transfers in. And so hospitals that are not normally keeping these complex patients are having to keep them on site, treat them on site, um, without the experience or quite frankly, the desire necessarily to keep patients they would have otherwise have transferred. But the ones that have managed to have telehealth coverage for these types of specialty patients, um, they're able to see improved patient outcomes across the board. And this is both for the short and long term. So what this means is not only were they able to keep the patients during this COVID surge when nobody was taking transfers, but once they realized they were able to keep these patients successfully, have excellent clinical outcomes, have excellent financial outcomes for the hospital, this became more of their long-term plan. Like, okay, if I can keep them during the COVID surge, I can keep them normally when we're not in the middle of the surge. So they were doing things like getting guidance on ventilation management and other critical care issues for patients in, in the ICU. They were getting help evaluating patients for novel COVID treatments like monoclonal antibiotics bodies. Um, and then that, even taking the whole COVID patient population aside, they were able to stabilize, treat, and clear patients for discharge across all specialties much faster to open up the much needed beds when in the midst of these key surges, as well as on a continuing basis after. So that means they were able to get more typical specialty care. So for things like sepsis or wound care, bacteremias, as well as stroke management, um, cardiac care, uh, things that would normally have been transferred out, they're finding that, hey, we can keep them. We, we had to do it, so we did it, and now we are comfortable doing it. So they're keeping all these patients and increasing the CMI and the complexity level of the patients they're able to treat on site, which is fantastic. Um, they were also able to set up hospital-specific protocols for COVID patients, psychiatry patients that would normally have been an automatic transfer out. Maybe now they're able to keep them, uh, stabilize them through medication management, and then discharge them to their family or to their own care. Um, they're able to have set specific protocols set up for ventilator stroke cardiac patients. Again, that would normally have been transferred out because the comfort level wasn't there before without the specialty backup to manage the patients on site. And then on and I'll, uh, uh, sorry, 
60, uh, so what that has led to now is, is the understanding and the ability to, to realize that over almost 80% of inner hospital transfers now are preventable with remote specialty coverage. And this, this is a key point here. This is without additional resource investment. So this is not buying a fancy $100,000 robot. This is not investing in new TVs in every single room. This is not you know, upgrading your entire EMR system or anything like that. This is with the resources you have on the ground, whether that's an iPad on a stick or a workstation on wheels, with your existing EMR, with your existing staff, um, over you know, almost two thirds of these transfers are addressable by a remote specialty consult. Obviously the largest ones are the largest types of patients that come in, uh, cardiology, neurology, pulmonology, and ID. And, and just having the access to the physician to help figure out what is the plan of care, what, you know, what does this test mean? What is the EKG telling you? What is that culture telling you? Um, what is the appropriate next steps? All of that is helping um, these patients, especially the ones that don't need a procedure, be able to be treated locally and avoid that unnecessary transfer. So this is gonna be critical. This was critical during COVID and it's gonna be critical for the ongoing future financial health of these hospitals. I'm gonna hand it off here to Anand to talk in more detail here about the specific value proposition for hospitals. Thanks, Mina, appreciate it. Yeah, so kind of talking about, we talked about the uh, um, you know, problem and the opportunity here. You know, wanted, wanted to get into some nuts and bolts in terms of uh, what this actually means for the hospital and what is the value proposition, both from a patient care perspective, as well as for a, uh, from a financial perspective as well. So uh, Telestroke is a uh, really well-known value proposition. It's become uh, kind of for every, uh, for most hospitals, um, kind of something that's uh, thought of as a necessity uh, if you don't have um, live neurology coverage. Uh, and so uh, when we think about the Telestroke uh, consult value proposition, uh, you know, the idea is that you don't want um, these uh, patients that are completely bypassing your hospital because you don't have that, uh, that capability. And so when you think about it, uh, kind of the lost revenue per case, uh, you know, for, uh, for, for a patient that uh, goes by your door is anywhere from 20 to $25,000. Uh, and for typical uh, small uh, community hospitals, we see that there's about 100 of these that will uh, kind of bypass uh, per year uh, if, uh, if you don't have uh, Telestroke coverage. Uh, however, Telestroke um, coverage is difficult to implement. It requires uh, very specialized um, uh, equipment often, uh, it requires uh, working with a partner that can provide you essentially immediate access to tel teleneurology, uh, teleneurologists, uh, which oftentimes uh, incurs high standby fees and other high fixed costs. Uh, and while you can get reimbursed, generally your ability to get reimbursed relative to the amount that you are spending uh, on uh, the uh, physician services is relatively low. Uh, when we think about in comparison, uh, to tell a specialty uh, consults, which um, people don't often think about in the same way. Uh, you know, when we've run the numbers, uh, you know, it's anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand uh, dollars. These complex cases that are able to be uh, transfers able to be prevented uh, if you're able to uh, keep those uh, patients. Uh, and while um, you know strokes, uh, there are a high number of them. We see even more in terms of on uh, the research that we've done. Uh, about 150 for your average uh, community hospital of cases per year that can be impacted by uh, telespecialty consults. Uh, it's easier to implement because oftentimes uh, most of the value can be gotten by non-urgent uh, cases. So it's easier to um, do. It uh, doesn't require specialized equipment. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, the, uh, the video consult uh, is a piece of the overall uh, value proposition, but it's um, uh, much more kind of the expertise that's the, of, a, of a credentialed physician being able to uh, go in uh, and guide the patient treatment plan, uh, looking at it uh, at, the, um, uh, at the case itself. Uh, and your ability to get reimbursed relative to how much uh, you're gonna pay for each of these consults uh, is higher. Uh, you may not be able to recoup uh, all of the costs of the program, but you're able to recoup a significant amount, and especially more if you're uh, a rural hospital that's designated a rural by, by CMS. So when we think about, uh, you know, these, one of the biggest uh, piece here, as we've talked about, is reducing unnecessary transfers. Um, and as we discussed, you know, each unnecessary uh, transfer um, from a hospital uh, costs them on average of $15,000, uh, both in lost revenue from the bundle payment, uh, as well as high value ancillary services. 
Uh, and oftentimes, uh, you know, you're losing the patient after you've uh, made your biggest investment uh, in the patient in the first couple of days, um, and uh, then having to transfer it out with a reduced payment, um, uh, you know, depending on the payer, uh, is definitely uh, painful and a hurt, uh, a, a kind of bigger hit to the bottom line. Uh, but what it also uh, impacts are a number of other key metrics for the hospitals, uh, bed utilization, uh, your ability to get higher bundled payments because you're uh, improving your overall uh, case complexity. Uh, you're able to discharge uh, patients faster uh, if you have these, uh, this expertise in a very uh, timely manner. Uh, and it just helps in terms of the overall confidence of the attending physician's ability to deliver care. So here's an example in terms of uh, uh, just how it hurts the overall system. You know, it's, it's um, not just a problem for the, the patients, but it also has an impact overall on the system. Uh, and so if we think about uh, what, um, you know, a sepsis patient that's transferred to a larger payment, uh, this is an example using uh, CMS, um, so Medicare uh, uh, payments, uh, then you would, uh, if the patient is transferred to a larger hospital, there's going to be a discounted bundle payment that's paid to the original hospital. They're going to transfer the patient. Uh, they're going to pay the full higher bundle payment at the receiving hospital. Uh, and uh, you're also going to have additional fees and tests and all that stuff at the receiving hospital. You know, total amount here, uh, you know, can be well over $20,000. If you're kept at the original hospital, uh, then that uh, bundle payment could go to the original hospital and you can get uh, significantly more value by getting the specialty consults uh, in that original site. Uh, and so you're talking about uh, not just a savings for uh, the hospitals overall uh, and an impact to their financial uh, bottom line, but this is a strong impact to both the, the system overall and the payers themselves. So a couple uh, case studies with hospitals that we've worked with. Um, you know, we worked with a 150 bed hospital that uh, with uh, infectious disease. Over seven months, uh, we were uh, able to see 162 patients. So we consulted and followed up on 162 patients. Um, of those, uh, nearly 70% were high complexity cases. Uh, during that time, we actually were touching nearly a quarter of the ICU patient census. Uh, and uh, of those 162 patients, only four patients were transferred for a high level, higher level of care. And what was really um, interesting to see and impressive and kind of got, gets to in terms of just the amount of ICU patients uh, census touched is that the patients treated uh, by our physicians had an average CMI of 2.82 versus 1.72 for the hospital overall. Um, so uh, our physicians were helping to treat um, uh, you know, extremely complex patients uh, and keep them in the system. Uh, and when, uh, in terms of uh, mean length of stay, over 81% of the patients were discharged under mean le length of stay after consult. Uh, and what that kind of uh, fell down to uh, when, when you uh, kind of crunch the numbers based upon those types of cases is about 2.7 million in annualized additional revenue for that hospital. Um, we also, uh, another example with a smaller uh, hospital, a 50 debt hospital where we're uh, uh, providing multiple uh, patient lines uh, over a year and a half, we provided 233 uh, patient consults. Uh, of that, we've prevented 176 transfers. Uh, so a significant number of uh, these transfers are being prevented. What we've seen is that uh, oftentimes these consults are uh, necessary. Over 95% uh, are uh, result in a change to the treatment plan that is executed by the attending. Uh, so we're not seeing uh, kind of confirmatory um, uh, consults that are being called. Uh, and what we're seeing again is that a uh, high number of high complexity cases being retained, a significant increase in the case mix index. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting things we saw with this, uh, this case was that 30 day readmission rate uh, was significantly lower than the overall uh, 30 day readmission rate, um, yeah, you know, uh, due to uh, kind of the high level of care and better, uh, better patient care delivered. Uh, and so that uh, led to, for that hospital, uh, over a million dollars in annualized additional revenue. So I'll hand it back to Mina uh, in terms of uh, talking through some of the best practices for implementing a program. Great, thanks, Anand. Um, moving to that first slide there. Uh, 
Um, so we're, we're looking at why aren't teleconsult programs more prevalent? So as, as we've all probably seen, we've had teleradiology and telestroke for decades now, right? Since, since the late 90s, early 2000s. Why haven't there been a proliferation of other programs? Um, you know, telepsychiatry is a little bit out there, but again, not nearly as penetrated over the, you know, some numbers put the penetration of teleradiology at almost uh, over 80% and telestroke at over 70%. So um, what happened to everything else? So what happened really is that um, while telestroke and teleradiology were the first out there and the first approved by CMS, the other specialties were not nearly as fast to follow for a number of different reasons. One, um, it was just much harder to coordinate the panel, panel of physicians to do that. So Telestroke had very specific stroke certification requirements. The government was very involved in setting up those programs and how to do it. There was a, a clear checklist. So it was much easier for, for hospitals to set up those programs and follow the delineated steps. For a telespecialty consult program, it's left each hospital pretty much on their own. So that raises a whole host of questions from where do I find the physicians? How do I schedule them? How do I replace them? How do I make sure we're HIPAA compliant and secure if, if it's an automated system that's set up for me by CMS saying these are the prescribed straps and then you're okay. If you have to define it yourself, the liability alone tends to scare off many hospitals. Um, do I need to buy a super expensive cart? Because if your experience has been with telestroke and you see the cost of implementing a telestroke program, to do that in all, all other specialties might scare some hospitals away. Um, then, then there's questions about reimbursement and in terms of software and technology, what do you need to have it work with your IT? Again, if your experience has been radiology and telestroke, two very intensive programs to get up and running that need a lot of extra hardware, a lot of extra software and pretty and a very you know in-depth um, merger between your IT team, your Infosys team, and the medical team. Um, it's intimidating to think about doing that again and again for cardiology, for pulmonology, for ID, for psych. Um, and so, but the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel here is that's not the case for these programs. So the learnings that people got from telestroke and teleradiology are actually incorrect and are not the same way and not the same implications for setting up a standard telespecialty coverage program. So looking at that next slide, we'll go into a few of the best practices for overcoming these barriers and realizing what is actually applicable in this situation versus not. So some of the questions we've, we've seen, we've gotten is they think telehealth providers wanna charge me as much as hiring a full-time physician once you add in standby fees and big cost per click chargers. And you know what, that was uh, perfectly correct. So when telestroke started, when teleradiology started, um, the only way they were able to make that work was to have a panel of standing physicians for the required guaranteed response time of under 15 minutes and usually response times of five minutes. For a typical e &M consult, these are not typical stat consults where you need someone to respond that quickly. It's more, uh, more of a, I need someone to look at this patient today in the next few hours. So just having that flexibility of response time drops costs dramatically and should not be leading to those kinds of levels of upfront costs. So there shouldn't be any standby fees and big cost per charges. It should be in line with fair market value. Um, but you should also think about the overall value, right? So it could seem expensive if you're looking at it only on a purely per click uh, basis. But then if you're looking at hiring or subsidizing a physician to in place of that to keep those transfers, keep those patients, or you're looking at bringing in a locum, it's always going to be much more cost effective to set up an internal telespecialty program than it would be to either hire a physician even part time or hire a locum to to fill that need. So um, again, as long as you are aware of, of what the contract is calling for and not having the, the large standby fees when you don't need them and not having um, that the setup fees when you don't need them, you should be able to set it up in a very cost-effective manner. Um, again, similar to that, um, I had to spend so much money to set up a telehealth program. I have to buy cards, I have to credential physicians, startup fees, et cetera. So again, look, Look at the providers that are going to be out there. Again, for a telespecialty program, most hospitals today have the carts and have the hardware needed. You should not need to go out there and buy a brand new cart. Anyone telling you that you need to use XYZ cart for them to provide your services is just trying to uh, um, layer in some extra costs that you don't need to do. Um, as long as the, those physicians are able to, um, they do need to be credentialed and licensed and privileged at your facility. But beyond that, 
Um, you shouldn't, there is, there should be no extra fees for the cards. They should be able to work on the EMR system that you have, the cards you have, and then they should also be able to do it with a very clear program. So if you're asking for extra integration into your EMR, there might be some extra cost for that. But beyond that, um, there isn't a ton of extra costs that were typically seen for a telespecialty program. Um, in terms of finding the right doctors to support the telehealth when no one wants to do nights or weekend work, um, it's actually telehealth. So you're, ac you're able to look across the country for physicians. And there are a lot of physicians actually looking to um, change their lifestyle. COVID has taught physicians and, and taught all of our peers that hey, the medical space is not recession proof and we do get burnt out and we need to be able to work in a way that's sustainable for our lives and our families because we're people too. So um, there are a lot of physicians out there looking for a different and a better and a more efficient way of doing things. And um, telehealth actually is, is the number one um, desire for a lot of these physicians looking to move away from the day-to-day -day practice and day-to-day -day grind of of going into a hospital, seeing a couple of patients going out versus working from their home or office or other location and seeing the patients in a consistent manner back to back. So for them, it's actually ideal. And because it's telehealth and because you're able to recruit the best and brightest from across the country, um, there is actually a wider pool of physicians than you might expect. And, and contracting with the right vendor or the right provider group will help you find these physicians that will meet your needs. So we see you know, hospitals all the time looking for the typical Monday through Friday, seven to seven, nine to five, what have you. But we also see a lot of, hey, I have a physician that's only coming in Monday through Thursday. I need Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or I need nights and weekends coverage, or I need one week on, one week off, or what have you. Or I just, I, you know, there's so many infinite different ways that it can be, it can be fixed, but there are physicians out there. And we, we see that need met all the time every day, because again, you're pulling from the whole country and not just your local geographic region. And then the other thing to keep in mind there is even if you can't start with your full schedule, like let's say you want nights and weekends and you've only found someone to help on weekends, that's still impactful for you in terms of saving one, two, three transfers a month is, is going to be really critical for any hospital um, and really impactful for any hospital. So just because you can't do the whole thing at once doesn't mean you don't set up the program at all. Um, other challenges, the carts are too expensive and it doesn't make sense to invest in one. Completely agree. Most consults can be done with all, without all the fancy features of these $100,000 carts. So the robot carts that move themselves, the PTZ cameras, the horoscope, all of those are great. And if you already have them, fantastic. Um, but if you don't have them, we see many hospitals start with as simple as an iPad on a stick or a Surface Tablet Pro or just using their workstation on wheels and, and making sure that it has you know, a microphone and a camera and consistent high-speed internet access. That's literally it in terms of what you need to get a telespecialty program off and off, up and off the ground. Um, a, a internet connected device with a, a, a quality microphone and a quality camera. Um, and then of course the staff that's willing to, to bring in that, that, that group and, and work with that group, right? And that's actually more critical for it. Um, Every provider wants me to use a different setup and I have to buy and train my staff on new software each time. That is a huge problem. And that is something that the administration of a hospital can do a lot around uh, for managing the, the issues around that. One, um, we would not suggest working with somebody on a one-off basis. Again, with telestroke, teleradiology, that's all there was. You did have to pick a vendor on a one-off basis. Now, with the ability to see your need more broadly, identify the critical needs. What types of patients are you transferring? Are you having a huge issue in cardiology as well as pulmonology, as well as hematology, oncology? Is there, are there some areas where you'd like to offer coverage in for the value of your community, even if it's not necessarily driving transfers, let's say like an endocrinology or rheumatology. So whatever that need is, identify the need, identify what you'd like to offer your community, and then look for the vendors that can do it. There are, there are vendors out there, for example, we do this, that have multiple specialties under coverage. So then at that point, you solve that entire problem of trying to pick one vendor for each specialty and then training your staff on many, many different um, on many different um, systems, softwares, workflows, processes. That is the worst way to set up a program. The best way would be to pick one vendor that is multi-specialty, has one system and one workflow that is consistent across the board, regardless of the type of consult called, and then integrate well with them, right? Make sure that they're a part of your medical staff, invite them to MEC meetings, um, do the meet and greets. Everybody should be offering meet and greets. 
physicians don't want to feel like a cog in the wheel, right? Like everyone does their best work when they feel valued, when they feel part of the team. And that goes for your remote specialists as well. They want to feel like they're part of the hospital and the team um, and, and have that collegial relationship. And we find that and we've seen consistently again and again, outcomes are best when the trust and the, and the, the relationship is there between the on-site medical staff and the remote physicians. And how you do that is you work with a consistent provider across the board and integrate them into your on-site medical team. Um, and last but not least, again, this helps with this as well, it's difficult to get people to use the program. So again, we you should look for a, a vendor that is going to work with your existing workflows and you're 100% correct. If someone comes in and says, I'm gonna change everything you do and this is how you have to do it, that's not gonna work. Your nursing team is gonna rebel, your physicians are gonna rebel, no one's gonna use it. Um, so it'll be a nice fancy piece of, of software and hardware just sitting in the corner gathering dust. What you need to do is minimize such points with technology, find, find your key users, right? Who, who are the key users? Obviously the attendings we're putting in the consults, but is it gonna be the house supervisors, the AICs, the unit secretaries? Who's the one that's actually gonna be taking the cart to the patient's rooms? Um, who, who are the ones that are seeing this need? Get them to be your key stakeholders and your key proponents, and it's gonna be a much bigger success. And like I said earlier, I can't emphasize this enough. Make sure that the remote specialists and the on-site medical staff, both nursing team and the physician team really get to know each other, really build that relationship because that's how you get consistent use and consistent trust and consistent good outcomes. Going to that next page. Um, and at this point, I'll hand it back off to Anand to talk about the reimbursement trends from once you do set up these programs, what can you look forward to and how does it work financially? Thanks, Mina. So, Reimbursement, uh, unfortunately, is still uh, pretty uh, complicated. It can help offset the costs, but the value, uh, you should still think about uh, these programs in terms of uh, the value that you're uh, driving in metrics improvement. Uh, you know, right now, there are a number of different uh, kind of variables that affect reimbursement of these specific consults. Uh, you know, everything from uh, obviously the payer, the original originating site where uh, it's being called from, there are state rules and regulations. We've got uh, rural designation by uh, CMS, uh, the type and workflow of the service performed, uh, and then all of the temporary COVID emergency rules that we've been uh, living under for almost two years now uh, that impact all of that. So uh, it's really hard to predict uh, reimbursement, uh, but there's a clear creation of value um, to uh, offering it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, think about uh, kind of the value created in terms of um, you know, the, uh, as we've talked about before, the ability to eliminate the unnecessary transfers, increasing your overall facility CMI, reducing 30-day readmission rates, you know, and make sure that um, however you implement the program, that you're uh, very uh, rigorously tracking all of these outcomes and ensuring that you are getting the value from uh, these consults that you're expecting. Uh, but that being said, what we have seen uh, is that hospitals are able to offset the nominal cost of the program by up to 75% through reimbursements alone. Uh, so without even taking into account kind of the ROI that you can get from transfer reductions and other metric improvements, uh, you can significantly reduce uh, the uh, nominal cost of the program. Uh, and it just requires kind of uh, really kind of navigating uh, with your payers uh, all of these different rules. And, uh, you know, hopefully your, uh, your vendor should be able to help you uh, do that uh, and, um, you know, provide uh, guidance to your uh, billing team to be able to, uh, to get, um, uh, get a significant chunk of these uh, costs reimbursed. What is uh, good, though, given that situation is that, you know, payers are slowly trending towards simpler and more consistent reimbursement. Um, so there are some longstanding uh, kind of reimbursement, um, uh, you know, opportunities uh, that are there, uh, you know, for rural designated areas by CMS, there are the specific G codes, which we have uh, seen used uh, pretty consistently that pay pretty, uh, pretty well uh, for these specific um, uh, inpatient teleconsults. Uh, and what we've seen is that about half of state Medicaid programs offer some inpatient reimbursement. Uh, prior to COVID uh, hitting, uh, you know, we saw that there was a number of uh, different uh, kind of momentum going probably in about the year, 18 months prior to uh, COVID in 2018-2019. Uh, you know, there was expanded programs for interprofessional consults uh, and asynchronous uh, consults and interpretations. Uh, there was a push for uh, behavioral health specifically uh, to be able to be reimbursed. Uh, and there was movement uh, in state legislation and in other states across the country for telehealth parity for private payers. 
uh, which a lot of um, uh, private payers are implementing uh, even regardless without uh, kind of state legislation. And then obviously during the COVID emergency, uh, you know, things have uh, obviously uh, changed uh, significantly. So there was a removal of the restrictions for geographic constraints from uh, uh, from uh, CMS, the allow uh, non-video to be reimbursed. We'll see how long these um, last. And even if they're temporary, what we have seen, which will be a permanent outcome of this is overall acceptance of telehealth as a model for care, especially with, spe uh, with specialty consults has increased significantly. Uh, both from uh, the attendings on the hospital side, the CMOs of these hospitals, uh, as well as the physicians who are providing care. Uh, I think they have, uh, these specialists have realized uh, that they can add a lot of value to uh, patients they otherwise wouldn't have touched uh, through telehealth. Uh, and so in terms of as we look forward, uh, you know, we think a lot of these trends are going to continue. Uh, so there's a significant discussion that a lot of the COVID uh, restrictions that were lifted uh, will be made uh, permanent, uh, and we'll continue to see some of that uh, moving forward. Um, you know, hopefully, in terms of some of the things around geographic limitations, the telehealth, uh, the rural uh, designation is fairly tight from CMS. Uh, hopefully, there's an expansion of that, if not an overall removal. Uh, and what we're seeing is um, through a lot of research and uh, uh, and, and trends is that. Uh, you know, overall private payers are um, having less concern around overutilization uh, as uh, more and more case studies uh, and research is proving uh, the overall improvement to the system uh, by these, uh, by having this access available. So a lot of the concerns that especially in direct to patient uh, telehealth where you improve, increase access, uh, which leads to overutilization, what we're seeing is that when uh, this is put in the uh, position within the inpatient, um, uh, in, inpatient space, uh, you don't see that uh, those kind of unnecessary uh, consults being called. With that, I think we're, that's uh, our, our, our overall um, kind of presentation, uh, and I think we'll hand it off to, uh, to start the Q&A. I haven't seen any questions come in yet, but if anybody would like to submit via chat or Q&A, or uh, alternately, if there's anyone on the line that would like to ask their question verbally, at this point, you can use the raise hand function, and we can unmute your line, and you can ask your question directly if you would like. And just, uh, we'll give it a minute or two here to see if any questions come in, but we really appreciate your time, Anand and Nina. A lot of good information in here for our attendees. Um, and everybody, please take note, they've got the contact us down there in the lower left-hand corner. If you are accessing this after today's live session or if you're accessing this online, please use that to reach out to them if you have any questions. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any questions come in at this time. Thank you everyone again for joining us today, especially Anand and Mina for the presentation. And I hope you all have a lovely rest of your morning and a great afternoon. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having Thank us. You, everyone.